everyone. Um, today's session is all focused on the importance of investing in branding. I think something that many brands tend to overlook. So glad to have you with us today and in even more excited to have Gigi Li Cheng, who is the managing partner at BFY Capital and the former founder of Plum Organics. She's also the board co-chair of Naturally New York. And the reason why this organization is very much <laughs> um, where it is today. So kudos to Gigi and all of her help and, and thank you for getting this organization up and running. And I'd also like to introduce um, Jolene De De Delisil, not to be confused with my own last name, uh, who is the founder of the Working Assembly and also sits on the Naturally New York Advisory Board. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it off to Gigi to get started and we will save all Q&A, uh, which you're welcome to drop in the chat for the end of the session. All right, thank you, Gigi. Sorry. Um, thank you, Adrian, for that introduction. And, you know, super excited to be doing this panel together with Jolene, who is um, one of my go to's in terms of branding and, you know, such a great conversation um, that we're going to be having here. So, um, I guess by way of kicking things off, you know, just talking a little bit about the flow, um, we'll kind of start off. Um, with Jolene and myself, we'll talk a little bit about our backgrounds, and then it's just going to be very much of a conversation style. And, you know, no doubt questions will come up as we, you know, cover a range of topics. So please drop them in the chat as Adrian uh, mentioned, you know, we'll address uh, questions towards the end. Um, but to kick things off, you know, Jolene, you know, would love for you to share a little bit about your background, how you got to be doing what you're doing, and, um, you know, what branding means to you and why it's so important. Yeah, no problem. Hi, everyone. I'm Jolene Delisle. I am the founder and head of creative at The Working Assembly. We're a branding agency that's based in New York. We started the company in 2017, really timed it along with the pro kind of proliferation that was happening, um, particularly in New York with kind of emerging startups that were coming on and really getting nationwide attention at the time. And so we started working with very early stage founders. And then over the past uh, five or six years, we've also kind of welcomed clients that are more at the evolving stage too. So larger companies like Pepsi and Amazon and Mass Mutual brands that um, have a lot of um, historical significance or cultural significance at the moment and need um, support across innovation or new product lines. And so our team really, I think, is uniquely situated in that we're working very much with the very the earliest stage companies as well as kind of state companies that are um, at the largest um, stage as well. So excited to kind of dive deeper into branding because I think at whatever inflection point you find yourself in, it's a really relevant topic to talk about. Thank you, Jolene. Um, I absolutely agree. And, um, you know, so I'll just kind of share a little bit about my background. Um, you know, I've been in sort of the natural products better for you, um, you know, industry now for about 17 and a half years. When I founded my brand, as uh, Adrian mentioned, Plum Organics. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, kind of branding and Plum Organics later. But um, for me, my background prior to coming into this space and launching Plum is in, um, you know, was also on the agency side. And, you know, I was kind of um, on the strategic planning and consumer insights part of the business, if you will. So trends and branding and sort of like that connection with consumer has always been super important for me. Um, just kind of kind of my passion areas and kind of like what makes me tick. Um, so, you know, I'm very excited to be talking about this su subject today and, you know, um, since founding Plum kind of have been in this industry, worn multi many different hats and now at BFY Capital, um, you know, I'm a partner there and we support and invest in early stage brands. Um, and so, you know, that like that aspect of my journey has also just been super, super interesting as like a founder myself. Um, and then, you know, as Adrian mentioned, just as we were looking at the community and wanting to launch Naturally New York, um, you know, it was just 
it just meant so much to me to be able to do it with, you know, other incredible leaders in this space that are based in New York and to be able to do it together. So i um, very excited for the community we've built here. And thank you all of you for being part of that community and joining us here today. Um, so I, I guess like Jolene, you know, it's really great to hear that, you know, when you started working assembly, it was very much, you know, maybe leaning into the startup, um, you know, ecosystem and the desire for, you know, that community to have better options in terms of branding. Because I have to say, like, I think what you guys do is really quite amazing. Um, you know, I really appreciate the fact that, you know, each of the brands that you work with are distinctive and, you know, that you also now have this range. So I guess, you know, given the fact that our audience and the people in this community, for the most part on the earlier side, could you maybe share a little bit about, you know, what that kind of like ideal or typical branding process looks like? Um, what are those steps and, you know, what is like, what are the must have, must, must haves because um, generally people don't have big budgets, right? So what are the things that are so important and in a way, you know, you might be saving yourself money down the road? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. I do think that the answer doesn't really vary as much as people think it does, depending on the stage that you are at, because ultimately when you're thinking about kind of that ideal branding process, oftentimes that exercise is really the same, whether you're at the earliest stage when we were working with Sanzo, for instance, you know, helping him kind of develop that brand from the ground up, or, you know, I think I think about last year when we did kind of a refresh for Haven's Kitchen or Partake, where, you know, those brands had already been in market and there was already some brand equity there. And there was a, it was really about kind of refreshing their brand. I think at either ends of those spectrum or where you're at in the journey, you really just need to think about how you, um, or at least something I suggest is really understanding kind of your why and understanding what, co what makes you unique um, from everyone else. And then our job as branders are really to think about how to tell that story in a coherent and, and cohesive way that really resonates with their, that target audience. So yes, of course, like visual identity is one aspect of it, but I actually think a bigger part is really understanding like foundationally your kind of brand positioning and your unique place in the market, um, how you differentiate from your competitors. And I think that's actually what a lot of branding is really around is creating that consistency, that cohesive story, and then thinking about all those various touch points that are really important and most important to your customer journey to make sure you get right and uh, consistent. Because I think that's that's where I really think brands win is when, uh, and, and that doesn't necessarily always take dollars to do, it's just wherever you show up, um, showing up in the same way every time. I think that's really uh, what good branding is about. Yeah, I, I, that resonates a lot for me. And I guess um, just kind of, you know, could you expand a little bit about, you know, I think it makes sense, right? Like understanding your why, making sure you show up consistently, but, you know, how do you work with clients or, you know, maybe there may be brands that don't necessarily have a budget or are pre-launch and starting to think about these things, you know, how do you, how do you get there, if you will? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think a lot of times too, like, you know, and I'm curious too, Gigi, your, your take on this, because I know you built Plum oh, sure. and um, you were kind of one of the first kind of lifestyle oriented brands. And I think one thing that you did really well with Plum is, you know, really finding this kind of better for you food space and really being able to capitalize on that and actually be such an innovator and pioneer in that space. And I think now, as we're seeing more and more brands kind of emerging in this very like kind of designification, very packed, crowded CPG aisle, you know, oftentimes it's, you know, how do you really stand out? And so I think to go back to your original question of like, what are those kind of foundational pieces and steps? I think, you know, oftentimes people think that investing in brand at the earliest stage is kind of maybe too soon and, you know, they should kind of get their name out there and, and their product out there before they really focus on kind of all those other pieces, which at sometimes people can think is like, almost, you know, excessive, you know, they're like, oh, I don't want to spend the money on, on um, my logo or my name. I want to just kind of get my product out there. And what we see now are, you know, brands that have been out for a year and a half, and now they're 
changing their name. I think we just saw that like, you know, a week or, or a month ago, I saw like a, a big dumpling company just change their name and they've been out in market for a year and a half or two years already. And you know, now you're kind of having to rebuild that brand equity and brand recognition with, with your customers who've already kind of started looking for you or have been talking about you. Or, you know, you're changing your packaging because you realize that your packaging isn't really conveying what your core um, you know, values are or your core uh reasons to buy that product are. And so now you're having to kind of rejigger what that packaging looks like after, you know, maybe you've already been distributed in all of Whole Foods Northeast. You know, I've seen that happen too. And so I do think there's a lot um, that you can save yourself money and time and aggravation on later if you actually get those foundations right to begin with. Um, and I know that's difficult and sometimes hard to do. And, you know, hindsight's always better 2020, but I think that you know, if you can, if you can make that investment and think about um, even just those foundational pieces that you know are going to really be a mainstay as far as who you are as a brand, I do think those are the ones that are, are worth investing in early. Yeah, I think that that makes sense. And, you know, you touched on sort of my process with Plum and, you know, kind of coming from the agency world, um, investing in the brand was so important to me. Um and, you know, for my own process, right, like I can tell you, it was the single most expensive part of startup costs that I invested in. Um, you know, maybe it was just because it was like my favorite thing to do. So I was like, okay, I'm going to spend money here. Um, but in the end, it did actually literally save me money down the road for all those things that you're saying, right? Like, you you know, some people were like, oh, you know, well, plum baby, or, you know, um, they wanted me, you know, one of the ideas on the table was like, why don't you call it Gigi's baby food and, you know, things like that, which all felt very limiting to me. And, um, you know, I did go through a process with an agency of really exploring a bunch of different names and what it could mean. And I think that it can be very powerful because, you know, as you say, a brand really is so much more than just the visual identity. And there's so much that you can signal and speak to um, that maybe is, you know, not necessarily obvious. So one example is, you know, like the name itself for Plum Organics, like I deliberately made organics part of the name and the brand because it was a defense mechanism for making sure that it, you know, the, wherever the brand went, wherever the company went, you know, organics and organic ingredients was going to be a core pillar. Right. And, you know, we played around with it. Like, is it a modifier? Is it actually in the name itself? Is it a descriptor? You know, all these things. And ultimately, um, you know, it was very important that the name, the organics was in the name. And, you know, actually like fast forward three years later, you know, we were going into Target and they were trying, they were wanting a different price point. And, you know, one of the first things my investor said was like, hey, you know, do you think that we can move to maybe like 70% organic and, you know, we don't have to have the seal and we could say made with. And I was like, ah, uh -uh, no, you know, and I couldn't have anticipated that, but I knew that it was important to me. Um, and kind of just kind of expanding on that a little bit more, um, you know, I'm kind of curious, you know, um, how you guide your clients if they really have no idea, like they're sort of like, I want to start a, you know, brownie company and, you know, it's my grandmother's recipes and, you know, I think they can be different in these ways. And I'm really looking for, you know, um, to kind of like tap into this market and, you know, capture this part of the um, segment, right? Like they're, they're much more focused about like the story of themselves and what it is they want to do in the world versus, you know, I think you know, I always kind of joke because I'm like the best and the worst client because I've been on the agency side. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, like, what are some of the things that you do in teasing some of these things out, especially for first time founders, people maybe don't have experience with branding? Yeah, I mean, I think that especially with how not that it's easy to bring a product to market, but it is a lot easier to create new products and brands there uh, than ever before, which I think is exciting, but also 
a cautionary tale because you know how many of these brands do we need you know how many hot sauces how many sparkling waters how many you know organic you know baby food companies do we need and um, I think it's really about figuring out that differentiation and that marketplace why which is something I try to really uh, to get to the bottom of even on initial discovery calls with clients when they call us and you know ask us about you know, working together and what that collaboration could look like. I really try to dig into that differentiation. And I do think that one thing you just touched on really quickly is pertinent, which is the founder. You know, I do try to identify whether I do think that founder has a lot of passion, grit, um, resilience, like ability to kind of bring this product to market under compelling enough um, way of discussing their product and and making me a believer in it because I know that's going to be a huge part of whether they're able to do it kind of on a larger scale within the market. Uh, I do think that, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, GG too, that what we have been seeing recently, especially within the CPG space, is founders being so closely tied to that product, right? Even in ways that you we never had before. I mean, I think about when I was growing up and and even learning about Newman's own, like I didn't really know like Paul Newman, like, I, I mean, it was great. And I think it's, at, or even Ben and Jerry, like I didn't know kind of who they were as the founders of, the, of that company. It wasn't, you know, of course it was part of decision-making. I think like on a larger, like cultural sense people were making based on like the ethos of both of those companies. Maybe those aren't the best examples, but I don't think, I think that we've seen kind of a rise, especially with the past 10 years where people are more, more observant and more uh, wanting to understand who the founders are, what those stories are, and you know, and and to your point about the recipe, like where those recipes come from, or if there's that aut- authenticity that they're really going to kind of attach themselves to within the brand. And I wonder, you know, one thing I always try to advise is how do we build not just a compelling brand, but also within that personal brand, because that's oftentimes what what early stage founders are doing. They're building their personal brand first. Um, and then they're building kind of their brand second or kind of in parallel. Um, and, you know, how do we distinguish between those two in a way that doesn't kind of separate you and also attach you too closely to the product, especially as you scale within the market? Um, so that's those are all kind of questions I ask in like early discovery calls. And I'm curious, Gigi, for you, if that's something that you had to kind of wrestle with as well as a founder. Yeah, I think you make a really great point in sort of, um, you know, separating kind of like the founder story from the story that the brand is telling. And sometimes they can have overlap, certainly, right? So, you know, in my case, it was, you know, my experience as a mom of a young child, et cetera, et cetera. But that's kind of like what led me there. But then the brand and the company represented something that was bigger and a broader extension of my experience. And so, you know, I I think it's important in a way to kind of highlight, right, like who the audience is that you're talking to. So, you know, I um, feel like kind of like the founder's journey is much more of a, you know, like if you're talking to investors, if you're talking to, you know, if it's more of a B2B or, you know, like um, maybe if it's like an article on whatever, right? Um, Where there's more space and opportunity to tell a more meaningful and granular story. Um, But then the story about the brand and the product, I mean, we all know, right, like consumers only have a few seconds. And so you have to speak to them very, very quickly. And sometimes, you know, you can have some shorthand so that they get it immediately and they, they can make that connection between the founder's story and why this product is in the market. But then at a certain point, the product itself has to have, you know, start to develop its own story, right? Um, And so I think in the beginning, the two are much more intertwined, but as the brand begins to scale and grow, you know, you sort of have to make sure that it can start to have its own story separate from the founder, Um, you know, just again, because you don't always have that time to tell the more involved story of the founder, but at the same time, right, like, 
you need it to be able to start to tell new stories and other stories and maybe yeah. connections with the community and the, totally. the, you know, all of those things too. Yeah. That's exactly what I advise too. I always say to founders that kind of your personal brand as a founder, it is uniquely tied to the business. And oftentimes it's really positive. It makes you more human. It builds a lot of integrity and trust right away, but you as a person is not scalable or something you can replicate. And so your whole identity can't be the brand itself either. So I think about um, the founders as the best ambassador that you could have for the brand. They embody like the ethos. They're helping you amplify that vision for the brand to consumers, but they can't be the brand entirely itself. So yeah, definitely something I, I think about a lot. And especially as brands scale from being kind of boutique to being more national, something that we have to kind of figure out how to distinguish even more. Uh, it's interesting. We are working with a granola brand who started out on Instagram. You know, he was a influencer. He started kind of making this Instagram during the pan, um, this granola during the pandemic and sharing his story on online and through social media and then started garnering like all these people who are really interested in purchasing the granola and then you know he started shipping them to people and starting to get their feedback and I think it's a really good example and use case of you know on one side you could be someone who could say do we really need another granola brand there's so many out there but you know I think by testing in such a unique way through social media and getting that um, user feedback and integrating that into like his core brand, uh, he was able to distinguish like the brand itself that he was building from him as a personality, um, which I think is a really good example of a way to do it, you know, in a way that, you know, you're kind of involving people and you're using yourself as kind of that ambassador influencer, who's kind of the, the, uh, the person who's kind of introducing that brand to everyone, but, you know, the brand itself is not him. Yeah. No, and I think like you bring up a great point. I'm curious, um, you know, even since 2017, since you started the Working Assembly, um, you know, social media in all different formats and channels is, you know, has become such an important marketing tool. Um, you know, how, I guess, like, how have you um, evolved, if you have evolved, you know, how you think about creating the brand um, in that kind of context and environment, because, you know, it, there's some very practical things as it relates to, you know, something sitting on shelf, but then there's also the other side of, you know, being able to make it come alive in on TikTok or something. Yeah, definitely. I think that it's been interesting because part of when we build a brand and a foundation standpoint is, um, has been really thinking about, um, you know, what those those uh, pieces that can't kind of change and morph, which I think of as, you know, your visual identity, your brand story, your brand purpose, your brand vision. But then there's so many other elements that uh, can continue to evolve and build as you build the brand itself. So for instance, like Haven's Kitchen is a really great example. I I'm such a huge fan of what Ali has built and done, you know, starting out as a cooking school, then building a product of sauces. And then now I think she is, such a great example of how she can use the power of social media to really help amplify and continue to build out her brand, you know, so, you know, building out the brand identity and the visual foundational pieces of what the brand looks like and sounds like and feels like that's all kind of done by our collaboration with her, but her, what her team has been able to do kind of to continue to expand that story and developing kind of this rich community on TikTok where, you know, they're, advising people on their Thanksgiving dinners, they're sharing recipes, they're, you know, creating really fun um, content that people are really engaged with and love. I think that's all really good examples of how uh, if you have the right foundational pieces and you have that permission of understanding where your brand can go and what your brand is about, which is bringing happiness to people cooking and adding that joy, then you can look for ways to extend that uh, as a brand in all different ways that are really powerful. And so it kind of, that could be strategic partnerships, that could be things that are outside kind of the traditional um, means and channels. And it can also be all around like organic content that's really on brand and in line with your brand positioning if you have a really good foundation. Yeah, I love that example. I'm a huge fan of Allie and Haven's Kitchen too. I'm very sad that, you know, the cooking school closed. Um, but, um, you know, and I, I think like that's a really good one to unpack a little bit um 
and in the sense like, and maybe it kind of goes to the heart of when we think about, um, you know, why it's important to invest in branding, right? And, you know, for example, functionally, the products are about saving time, you know, are about, you know, making uh, meal time easier, prep, all of that stuff. But fundamentally, you know, it's, I think like our tagline is like cook happy, right? And so how does one think about kind of making that jump of like, you know, more than just like we save you time and our, our products are high quality and it makes, you know, blah, blah, blah easier. Um, then how do you then like make that next um, evolution, if you will. For you know, sure. So then you know, tapping into you mentioned that tagline because on the surface, it can seem really simple, but I think where we got to that line and to that kind of brand mantra really came from, uh, from really diving deep into kind of their functional benefits. Like why, why uh, using Haven's Kitchen as an example, why Haven's Kitchen uh, does get to that emotional benefit, which is like the cook happy, the ex you know, the exterior facing line, external facing line, you know, I think that all comes from two things that you're saying, which is when we make, you know, people save time, they can focus more on enjoying it with others. They can enjoy being by themselves. You know, when we are able to make uh, cooking, demystify like the stress of cooking, we're able to make people feel happier. You know, I think those, that kind of idea of figuring out your purpose and your why is all part of that brand building. And then that external facing message, which can seem so, you know, simple and like a throwaway actually can really be powerful because it's something that uh, really speaks to like your truth of, of why you exist as a brand out in the world. Yeah. No, I think I love it. I think, you know, we're, we've got a little PSA for Allie and Haven's Kitchen going on here. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I kind of wanted to just maybe um, share a little bit of my observation too, because it, to a comment that you made earlier about, you know, there is a lot of clutter, there's a lot of, you know, companies that are um, launching, et cetera, which, you know, is amazing, right? Like we want innovation, we want people to be putting themselves out there and their products out there, but it's harder and harder to break through. And I, I remember when I first started, right, like Plum, I would say, I, I don't know if I can say like we were the very first, but we were certainly one of the earliest, um, you know, what I would consider a modern brand and more lifestyle oriented, particularly in the food space. So not just, you know, in like the better for you side, but you know, we were the first to use a white background in packaging. And I remember going with my, um, you know, kind of my branding agency to like a Safeway because they were based in Northern California and walking the aisles. And I was absolutely shocked that no one was using white background for food. And I think around then like Lean Cuisine had just rebranded and come out with, you know, and I don't even know, I haven't looked at it in so long, but they had the white box for a long time. And before that, it was like yellow and orange. And I don't know if people remember that. But, um, you know, because I thought to myself, like, surely someone must be using white packaging. And we walked the aisle. So it wasn't even like a Whole Foods, but it was a safe way. And no one had white packaging. Um, so that was one thing. And then, you know, from there, it was also, you know, my original um, box had these like ginormous, like close up faces of these like delicious babies, you know? And so just to your point about like connecting the emotion, you know, like you couldn't help, but like, you know, even if you didn't have a baby, like to, to respond to that image. And, you know, I was like try really trying to tap into that aspect of, you know, cause early motherhood can, you know, be very challenging in all kinds of ways. And, you know, kind of signaling as a reminder, like, hey, you know, yes, there's all these questions. Yes, you may have uncertainty. Yes, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But like, let's come back to like why we're wanting to do best, do better, make better choices. You know, it is about this like cherub and kind of like having that signal of the baby face as that reminder of the happy, right? And so I share that background more from the point of view of like we were one of the first and... um 
kind of more lifestyle oriented, more modern, simple to tap into, um, you know, emotion, imagery in a different way. But I feel like, you know, brands these days, like, you know, we've got the visual identity down, right? Like they're all, they all look really great. They all look modern. They all have like fun and amazing colors. Um, but I'm kind of curious, you know, from your point of view, how, um, you know, like what are the potential risks and pitfalls of that? Yeah. And it's funny when you mentioned that kind of uh, grocery walk, we actually do that a lot with our clients too. I think most recently we went on a walk with Jake Neller and the Sweet Nothings team to the Whole Foods um, off of Madison Square Park because we were look, we were kind of searching around kind of protein bars and nut butter bites, uh, the ones that we launched for them. And kind of wanted to see like what the best practices were. And, and it's, it is, I really do encourage people to go to the aisle and see like what's popping on shelves. Cause you'll be surprised by the brand recall that you have and what you're able to really see and what stands out and kind of that brand hi hierarchy too, of like, oftentimes you think your brand name has to be bigger than actually your flavor name. And actually when you go to the, um, the aisles, you'll see like flavor team is actually all you really care about. You want to know like what that is. And that's a really big way of getting you hooked into the brand and wanting to learn more about it. But that's a whole other thing. But yeah, to your question around like trends and pitfalls, I think exactly that word trends is a big thing that I really try to discourage clients from falling into. I think it's very easy to see brands out there like, you know, recess or, you know, um, you know, liquid death or these brands that you're like, oh, wow, it's so cool. And they're so designed and, um, you know, it's so interesting. And I think oftentimes what I tell my team is we're not designing for ourselves. We're not designing for other designers. We're designing for the market. We're designing for the product and the company. Uh, it's not based on our likes and dislikes. It's not based on things that we think are cool or fun, or we want to try. It's really about you know, what's actually going to stand out? What is something that could, is going to feel classic? It's going to resonate for a very long time. It's not going to need to be redesigned 10 years from now or even five years from now. And those are the things that we really think about is what is that interesting white space visually for the brand to live in? Um, and, and why does that make sense for, for them to be there? So that's what we really try to investigate and think about. And I think if you fall into kind of trends or looking like, what your competitors are doing or what's happening in the market too much, uh, you can fall into a little bit of that sameness, which I think is something that we all try to avoid. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I want to be mindful of time. I think like we have a few more minutes, but I wanted to kind of, um, you know, I guess like build upon two points that you made, you know, one is, um, you know, this idea that it's not for you as the designers, but for the client and even for the client, um, you know, whatever that means to them, right? And and so I think, you know, everybody has a different aesthetic. And sometimes, you know, there are brands where I look at it and I'm like, oh, that's not like, I, I don't have a, like, it's not something that visually or emotionally appeals to me, but I can appreciate that it's different. And it was a choice that that founder made. Um, and two, you know, two brands that kind of come to mind are um, Harmless Harvest and, you know, um, Hue, right? And so both of those brands, like their aesthetics and stuff are not my aesthetics, but they have stood the test of time and they have made it their own and they, you know, and they're very, very successful brands. So I think that's the other thing is like sometimes, you know, you don't want to be the same as everyone else and that's okay as long as whatever it is you whatever it is you are is authentic and you know it makes sense and resonates for whatever messaging that you're trying to get across um that's yeah. one thing and then the other thing i wanted to just kind of highlight too to your point about like sometimes it's you know people just care about the flavor um you know, I think one of the reasons maybe like going back to this topic of like the importance of investing in branding, particularly for a CPG, is that there are things from a packaging and design and um, hierarchy point of view that are very important. And, and, you know, some of it might feel 
like you can figure it out yourself. But if you've never done it before, you really can't figure it out yourself, right? Yeah. Like even little things like, you know, the lip on the shelf. I mean, these are things that I've kind of learned, you know, by sometimes the hard way, right? Is like the lip on the shelf and making sure that like you don't have key information that's there yeah, because you don't there, right? appreciate that like yeah. it's going to be hidden once it's on, you know, like those kinds of things. Um, so just kind of flipping it back to you, like what are some of those things to like keep in mind, you know, other than like the importance of hiring an agency to help you? Um, you know, like if you were to think about, let's call it a hierarchy or priority of hierarchy things, um, what are some of those things to yeah. keep in mind? Well, it's interesting what you just talked about remind me of uh, when we were talking, when we did the branding for Sanzo, you know, we put his logo, the Sanzo logo on a vertical orientation, which in the sparkling water aisle or even just a beverage aisle wasn't something that was being done. And what it did was it allowed us to have a lot of real estate to introduce these Asian flavors, right, that were really unique and different, lychee, like maybe not as common and really highlight them and make them the star versus a name and a brand that no one's ever heard of um, and having that be the biggest thing. And so I think like ego aside, like put your ego and what you think is going to be the most important thing for a customer's side and really think about what's actually going to really pop and get your information across on the aisle, you know, um, and, and think about how to, to make that really the most important thing. And then also don't forget like those call outs, you know, don't have too many of them, but make sure that the really important ones, like if you're a protein brand, like knowing how many grams of protein is going to be really important to have on there. Or if you're organic, like making sure if that's a really core part of your product to your point, like having that within the name or something where it won't get just lost, you know, in kind of a sea of just the green little circles or certification. So I think all of that is, is super important. So all things that we talk about and think about. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Adrian, do we have any questions? I mean, I feel like Jolene and I could just keep talking, but kind of curious. I do have one question. Um, for the brands that are starting out, what are the first branding items we should invest in and how much money should we expect to spend on these? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a tough one. I mean, you know, one thing that I realized when I was starting the company was that, you know, we really started with the purpose of working with underserved founders, you know, women, founders of color, and really making sure they had a really clear kind of leg up in the market as they were entering it to have something that felt like a really professionally, like well-situated brand, especially knowing that would be a huge impact for them in fundraising and also getting interest from distributors. So it's something that we've always prioritized. And I think like is something that is important for us still to do. So we always try to tailor our fees and get really creative in ways that we could partner with early stage companies. That said, we're also super fortunate that there is a huge wave of amazing, talented designers and creative talent out there who are looking to work with founders and who are looking to, to help them. Um, I will say, I think visual identity is a huge piece that is important. I think something we talked about earlier was just people think of it as a huge financial investment, but it actually can save you a lot of money in the long run if you get it right and done well the first time. Uh, it builds your brand equity. It, it builds um, a lot of recognition for you on the shelf or on Instagram or wherever people are finding you. Uh, so I think that's important. I think getting your channel distributions right, like thinking about your go-to-market strategy as far as where you're going to be and how you're going to show up there. That could be email. That could be your Amazon storefront, like making sure you invest money and like making that look amazing if you're going to be selling there. Um, and then I would definitely say like packaging, think about your vehicle. You know, that's the thing that's going to, people are going to be carrying around with you and, um, and, and kind of your billboard. So how do you invest if you're a CPG product? I would say that would be a huge place to start thinking about making that investment. Think about that as important as, as, as important as your product itself. Yeah. And I, I think like, you know, a hard number is difficult, right? Because I could tell you what I spent on branding plum, um, you know, 
18 years ago. And that's still like a pretty big number today. But as I said before, you know, we never had to do it again. Right. And, and it's sometimes it's not just about the cost of not doing it again, but all of those, you know, maybe intangible things of having to, you know, um, kind of re-educate the consumer or even, you know, silly little things like UPC codes and what that means, you know, if you have to change something, because the implications of that can also be very big. And, you know, believe me, like I've, you know, talked to brands that are like 30, 40, 50 million dollars where, you know, they switch something and then there's an implication about the UPC code. And then there's all kinds of downstream implications that can lead to, you know, um, expensive, expensive um, implications. So just kind of coming back for a second, I would say, um, you know, whatever your budget is, I think the two areas that I would invest in the most is um, branding, obviously, and innovation, right? So, you know, I think maybe innovation, unlike branding, you know, there is more room to evolve as you go, right? Like your first version of whatever it is, I think doesn't have to be the absolute best, but it should definitely be as good as you can get it with the resources that you have. And then as you keep going, you know, like recipes and scaling and, you know, all those things like iterating on that, I think is something that you can continue to do. But like we were saying, you know, with branding, it's not something that you want to just continue to like, you know, I mean, yes, there will always be evolutions, but you don't want to be like, you know, really rethinking it as you are going. So for me, that's, you know, the two areas that are the most, most important. So I would just encourage like whatever your number, you know, whatever your budget is, however small or big, just to think about, you know, um, those are the two buckets that I would invest in the most. We have a question from Adam. Adam, why don't you unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Thanks, guys. Today, today has been great. Um, Jolene, uh, I think we've been connected, but we actually never have spoken. So it's great to connect with you here. And my question is, um, when you deliver a brand book and style guide mm -hmm. to a brand, do you include a copy and messaging guide for day-to-day -day comms on platforms like TikTok? or Instagram, or their rules around how a brand might show up in stories like made in Canva or done by like a social media manager versus branded or more owned content. So essentially, like how far down the comms funnel do you go with the brand and where they have more flexibility? I just wanted to get your sense around that. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that our agency is really unique in that we focus not just on branding, but we also focus on content and comms. So I think where you and I have had a lot of overlapping clients as well, which is great. I think it really depends on what resources they have on their side and how far we need to go with them. So right now we're working on um, Betty Buzz, which is a uh, Blake Lively's sparkling beverage brand. And you know, we're, we're coming up with scripts for tasting, you know, when they do in-store tasting, you know, how they talk about the brand and, you know, what, what the flavor cues that they want to highlight are. But that's super unique to them. Whereas, you know, a brand with really savvy kind of marketing team who has a lot of that uh, in-house and can handle that copywriting and messaging, we kind of just develop a messaging framework. So we say, here's kind of the brand personality. Here's how the brand talks and acts. You know, here's the way that uh, we show up on, on certain key channels on TikTok. We can be more playful. On Instagram, we're a little bit more serious. We're kind of pushing a little bit more product focus there. Whereas TikTok, that's usually our place to be a little bit more playful and fun. Um, you know, on stories, we can be a lot looser. That's where we're asking for our community engagement and we're trying to get more feedback and, and really get, uh, get thoughts and, and have a two-way conversation where, you know, on, on static posts or on, on our grid, you know, that's really where we're focused on branded content. So we kind of give that initial framework and then we really kind of dive deeper depending on what the client's asks are or how long kind of we're continuing to work with them and what our engagement is. But at the very base, we always give a brand book and style guide that at least has the basics of round and messaging guide or framework so that as you kind of launch, I think that's a huge piece of it. You know, branding in the past was so focused on just visuals. I think it's so much 
you know, I think you and I, Adam, probably agree on this too, is like, it's so much about how you sound and how you show up and the things that you say and what people are saying about you uh, can be even, is just as important as how you look. So, so we really think about that as a holistic brand offering. Awesome. Is there anyone else that would like to ask a question? You are welcome to unmute yourself or drop it in the chat. Please don't be shy. Um, while we're kind of waiting for hopefully a couple more questions to come through, I did want to, you know, maybe touch on something. So I'm kind of looking at some of the notes that Jolene and I had um, prepared before. And one area that we haven't touched on yet, which, you know, I like as an investor now, and one that I always um, have always believed was super important was just kind of like, when you think about a brand, you know, kind of like the way that it scales, right? So um, you know, today we've been talking a lot about the importance of getting it right in the beginning and the why and, you know, kind of building that foundation. But I also want to, you know, maybe touch on some points in terms of like, well, what does that mean in terms of, um, you know, like as it goes downstream, right? So some of the things that I feel are important, um, you know, is this idea of like, making sure that your brand is really more about a platform versus just a product, right? So even though you might only be a single product from the beginning or like at this stage that you're at, but thinking about it as a platform, right? So, you know, and everything that kind of goes with that. So yes, today you have this one product, but, you know, what are the things that you can build on or expand from there? And even if it is just like the single product, you know, what are the ways that you can, you know, grow it so that it can be more meaningful than just the product itself? And then, you know, beyond that, it's also just, you know, oftentimes I think, um, you know, people make the mistake of listening like this idea of like too many cooks in the kitchen right like you know maybe there's a trend that does this and maybe you know someone says oh you should do that and you know and I think that's also why like the some of the important branding work is important because the early branding work is important because it kind of becomes a little bit of your north star for you to be able to um you know always kind of like reference right to sort of be like well, you know, does it make sense for me to do this? And then, you know, maybe it does. But the other question is, um, uh, you know, at what point, you know, at what point does it make sense to do that? Like, maybe it's not now, but maybe it's two or three steps from now. And, you know, so those kinds of things are super important. And, you know, we've already talked about the fact that visual identity is just one component and a brand means so much more. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, you know, from your thought point of view, you know, obviously, what are some of the downstream implications of getting some of these foundations right? And what are some of the questions that they should be thinking about in terms of the future, but kind of being prepared for it? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to answer your question. Also, Regina's question in the chat at the same time, which is, thinking about kind of a holistic brand as a platform. So yeah, regardless of whether we're rebranding or branding a company and they only have one SKU or they have eight SKUs and they have multiple product lines within their company, we think of them as a complete entity of where they, their North Star, what their vision is. So, you know, Partake, for instance, you know, they, they had cookies when we started working with them, but now they have baking ingredients, they have pizza, they have, um, you know, they're doing partnerships with ice cream brands. So we really think about this, you know, and about what they could be as a brand that is absent of the product itself. So around what we thought about Partake was radical inclusivity, right? They're a brand that's all about this idea of including everyone with their gluten-free and you know, uh, ingredients that are allergen free and this idea of everyone being able to partake and enjoy uh, a product. So that means that they can do and gives them leverage to create lots of things where people can partake in snacks, right? That doesn't have to be cookies. It could be savory things. It could be um, even partaking in uh, like other food items, you know, so it just doesn't necessarily have to be so limiting. And so 
uh, Regina, your question around you know how you approach system packaging is we kind of thought about like let's vision map a little bit of what your future brands could look like. You don't have those products yet, but like what would this brand system look like if it was applied to you know spaghetti and also applied to pizza and also applied to cookies? So how does that product? flex it has a, a product branding flex and how does it feel expansive and that there's elasticity and really grow in a way that's exciting um, and so if you're engaged with any type of branding partner I would encourage you to do that not just look at one skew but also think about kind of that vision board of like what you ultimately can kind of think about for your brand and where you could go and even if you're not creating those brands right away I would use that as a litmus test for um, for any branding exercise, you know, to, to go through that. And since we're on the topic of packaging, we did have a question also as it relates to Sonic branding. Um, do you feel that's an important part of the packaging and should we be engaging more of the senses beyond visual? Yeah, you know, we've been thinking about Sonic branding a lot when it comes to like mnemonic. So when we work on like a big corporate rebrand and there's going to be kind of a mnemonic at the end, um, mnemonic is kind of like maybe almost like a jingle or like some sort of Sonic um, element that's connected to the brand or the logo. That's something we think about a lot. Um, so when we did Mass Mutual, for instance, uh, which is a big, you know, uh, financial service company uh, with a, a big presence, um, we did think about Sonic branding there, but in most of our kind of earlier stage companies or brands that don't have maybe like TV as an entity or video as, as something, we haven't been thinking about Sonic branding as much, but I do think that it is something that's going to continue to be something that we're going to think about more and more, especially as we think about different ways that we're shopping and, and consuming and, you know, engaging with brands. I think it's going to be something that will come up more and more. So, yeah, I mean... I would love to learn more about it. We also have a question from Zoe from Bim Bamboo. Uh, could you please speak to the best practices regarding the scrappy yet effective market research approaches when tackling a rebrand or branding work? Um, well, one that we we do that's that's um, a really easy one is we use uh, tools like Polefish. Uh, we also uh, which is, you know, a tool that you can use a very cost effective way to pull lots of different people. We'll also ask our um, any new brands that we're working with that have um, already existing like email CRM base that we can um, include some sort of poll uh, to that database and ask them questions. And then we'll also try to think about who those new markets are that we're going to be going after and thinking about ways that we can start engaging and asking questions there. So luckily that especially I think with um where things are as far as available tools out there. There's so many different ways that you can do effective market research in a much more cost-efficient way than you could even like a year ago. But I do think it's important. I think that getting data points and understanding your consumer is really important, um, whatever stage that you're at and understanding if there's market traction for your product. I believe the follow-up to that question from Zoe was what kind of questions would you pull? Could you um, show this? Yeah, it's really specific. I would ask about like uh, repeat customers, like why they're purchasing, uh, what makes them purchase again, why they're responding to um, when they did purchase, what made them kind of come back if there's been like a long period of time between. Um, I think about, you know, uh, if they have any feedback or, or or brand recall issues or other brands or competitors that they're also thinking about um, and anything that's preventing them from buying again. So whether it's price, availability, um, you know, variety, all those things. And Jillian, could you please rename the online research tool? No, oh, I think John did, yeah, Pullfish. And that's just um, one. I mean, there's a lot. I, I, um, we can happy follow up with anyone who has questions around that specifically after. And then we have a question from Megan before we start to wrap up the session today. Um, over the past few years, it's been there's been a shift from D to C only brands to omni channel, where wholesale plays a crucial role in unlocking growth. From an agency POV, has this been reflected in scope? Not only brand IDs, positioning, and packaging, but also going into B two B materials for selling presentation line sheets, decks, et cetera. 
<laughs> yeah, as part of our brand package, we always think about um, investor decks. We always think about um, sales decks as well, because I think that's a really big uh, big part of branding is making sure that you're thinking about both sides, right, of that channel. You're thinking about your consumer, of course, channels and and how people are purchasing you. And I think wholesale is a big thing. Like we've been doing a lot more, especially for our CPG brands, for what does Costco exclusive products look like? What does, you know, Amazon um, variety packs look like versus what's in store? Um, and then to your question about uh, about investing investment and um, the B2B space, I think like, you know, CPG brands are always thinking about investors and how to make sure that, the brand work that they did is coming through really well in a compelling way through investor decks as well. And understanding that their brand positioning is something that is going to resonate with that market. Um, and then I think sales decks is really important to make sure that your vision for those future product lines and all the things that you're thinking about in the future um, show up there too. So yeah, definitely we help brands with both because it's really important to think about both. Okay, uh, Gigi, would you do you have any closing remarks before we end today's session? Um, no, I mean, I guess like just thank you, Jolene, for joining me here today. Really enjoyed our conversation. I actually learned a lot too. Um, and you know, really appreciate everyone from the community showing up and hopefully um this was informative and um you know uh worthwhile use of your time. Yeah, thank you everyone for, for joining in. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Adrian and the Naturally New York team. Our pleasure. Thank you both so much.